So now we're going to, um, wow, that's pretty loud. I'll get away from that. Uh, we're going to begin the workshop part of the day. Uh, but before I do that, um, give me a hands in the air if you were at the press conference this morning or earlier. Okay. So I don't have to repeat anything. Okay. Very good. Uh, well, so uh, let me just say again, uh, we're so pleased that you're here. Uh, this now begins a process that you've been engaged in to a large degree. Um, anyone here who's one of my staff, like Western nurses and counselors, I see one, raise your hand, raise your hand, raise your hand. Okay, so uh, remember who those hands are, because that's a direct line uh, into uh, various programs and services of my offices. Uh, I want to thank you all again for participating in this process, and many of you for many years working with us. And I think we have the opportunity and the possibility here uh, to do something great uh, in this area of the state. And so with that, I'm not going to say more, because I said it this morning, and you heard it already, and I don't need to repeat myself. So again, I'm going to give you Stephanie and her team uh, to go over lots of information and data. Uh, and uh, they've done a great job, and Stephanie and her team were part of the group of people that wrote this. And so they know all the detail much better than I do. And here's Stephanie. Thank you. Hi. Wow. This is great that we have so many people together. Um, we're going to talk about the Social Innovation Fund grant called C Texas, uh, Social Innovation for a Healthy South Texas. Um, you'll see up here a couple of different logos. We have Methodist Healthcare Ministries, as you heard earlier, is the uh, intermediary organization. We were awarded a Social Innovation Fund, or SIF, grant. That grant comes through the Corporation for National and Community Service, which also does programs like AmeriCorps and Senior Corps. So you may have heard of them before. Um, and so what, we're going to get started on our C Texas initiative. And I don't have a, a clicker today, so I'm going to uh, give a nod towards May every once in a while to let her know it's time to switch slides. All right, social media, if you're into this sort of thing, here's what you have. Uh, with social media, we have our hashtag MHMCTexas. We did not put the, the accent, so you don't have to do that extra part on the, on the hashtag there. Twitter handles for uh, MHM is at MHMSTX. The Social Innovation Fund loves to retweet, so if you uh, add them at SI Fund, they'll retweet your stuff. All right, let's go to the next one, and we will introduce our team. We have uh, most everybody here in the room, fortunately. So uh, Becca Brun, who you heard from earlier, I don't think she's back down here yet, but we'll see her a little bit later on. She's our VP for Strategic Planning and Growth. Uh, I'm the Project Impact Manager, Stephanie McLean. I just took on this role uh, after we got the grant. I was hired in January to write grants, and then I got one, and they said, stop doing that, go manage it. Don't get <laughs> we don't want any more just yet. So um, now I'm managing this one. Then we have Santiago Garcia over on the side of the room. He's our program officer, so you'll be seeing a lot more of him. He'll be traveling to the region working with our subgrantee partners as we go through the next five years together. And we have May, who I pointed out earlier. She's our federal grants and programs assistant. And the accounting team is over there hanging out with Pastor Mickey. <laughs> we have Annabelle Moreno and uh, Vanessa Medina on that side of the room. Our evaluation team is not in here right this moment. Uh, Ann Connor is in town. You may have talked to her earlier. I think she's uh, heading back pretty soon. And then Michelle Brodesky just had a baby, so she'll be back, uh, in, back in action really soon. And then we also have uh, external evaluators. I think you heard earlier that we're reviewing 12 uh, really excellent proposals for that contract. So when that's announced, we will have an external evaluation partner also as part of our evaluation team. I'd like to go around the room and get an idea of who's here. So we'll start over here and uh, go around sort of clockwise-ish. If you can just say who you are, what organization you're with, and what brings you here, if you're a, a potential subgrantee or a, a partner or just someone from the community that's curious or a funder. We, I know we have a lot of different people in the room today. Do you want to get us started? Sure. Okay. I'm Rachel Udall with MHP Salud, and um, here because we're interested in applying for this opportunity. Hi, Rosalinda Rangel with Valley Regional Medical Center and Rio Grande Regional Hospital. And we are here because we're also interested in this opportunity. 
and good news, and I'm here as a board member of the Public uh, Community Center in McAllen, and has grant writer, and <coughs> just involved in health here in the Valley. My name is Deku George, and I'm a behavioral science faculty for the new Family Medicine Residency for University. I'm Dr. Del Valdez, I'm the Assistant Regional Dean, and we're very much interested in participating. Grace Lawson, I'm the Executive Director of Edmund Auto Clinic. MHM has been a um, terrific, terrific funder for us for like over 10 years. And uh, we're, I'm here because uh, I'm interested in perhaps applying. I'm Candy Wiley, I'm the Weston Nurse in Laferia. And obviously I'm here for support of MHM. I'm very excited about the Sea Texas and collaborating with the many opportunities that will be available soon. I am Shirley Arnold. I'm the clinic administrator at Proyecto Desert Royal in, uh, in Canitas. And uh, we're here, we have the Wesleyan nurses involved with our community center and also the counseling service involved with our center. And here to get some more information. My name is Sam Dowd. I'm a registered dietitian with the County Health Department, and I'm here to get some more information. Well, I'm Lizette Sykes, I'm from the Valley Council in Harlem, and we're here also to get more information. I'm the second part of the week. I'm Wally Hedgeman from Valley Council as well. My name is Wendy Sidemore Hodgeville. I am the director of Community Council Bureau of Grand Valley, better known as 211 Texas. Mm -hmm. I'm here because at this point, I'm curious. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Liz Sumian, I'm the director of programs at ARC, and I'm here to get more information. Good morning, good afternoon, Stephanie Gapiana from the Nurse School of Health. Good afternoon. 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 Good I'm Leslie Meyer, I'm also with the UT School of Public Health Nebraska. I'm Paul Parson, I'm a volunteer with the <coughs> Family Nutrition. I'm Elizabeth Gallo Brown, I'm on the Coalition for Education. I'm to expand our programs. Billy Cortez, we're a brand new Valley Health Information Exchange. We are your local health information exchange. I'm the Executive Director for Palmer Drug Abuse Program, and I'm here to see if you'd like to meet the MR organization. I'm here to see if you'd like to meet the MR organization. My name is Rose Timmer, and I'm with Healthy Communities in Toronto. I'm Terry Crawford with Tropical Fixed Day. We'll help them if you're interested in the possibility of these meetings and our integration programs. Your best is also about those things. Mary Valencia with the Rio Grande State Center in Harlemden, also looking at collaborating and uh, partnering. Sam Glorena, the grant writer for the Clinician Community Health Center in Arlington, and we're here to get information in my part. Cindy Bishop, Melissa Nurse in Edinburgh. Ms. Moore for the National Valley Health Institute. Very interesting. And more than and my name is I'm assistant dean of students overseeing the medical and medical services in the students at the UPA. And I'm here uh, looking at this today. I'm probably applying to the Thank you.
Santiago, I think we have one more at the table uh, back in the corner. Was it? Was there one person that didn't get to go? Uh, my name is Ralph Lee. I'm the Westie nurse. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ralph Lee. I'm the Westie nurse. 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 I'm the Westie nurse.
So why are, why are we doing this see Texas thing? This is a quote from uh, President Obama that gets us pretty close. The, um, the foundations across the nation, Becca Brunet alluded to this earlier, but the foundations across the nation and uh, the folks in DC consider us to be a hard to reach population. So when they write, when they, they write their uh, documents for grants, they actually call us that, we're a hard to reach population. And uh, we, don't, we don't think we're hard to reach, we're right here. But uh, they, they need some help getting to us. So they look for, this is true across the nation, there are different hard to reach populations, but we have a pretty special one here. So they look for uh, high performing intermediaries who have access to the communities that we want to serve. And so that's why we have this structure of the intermediary and the, the subgrantee partners all working together uh, to get things done. MHM has been working in this area for almost 20 years now, and we know there are organizations already doing what works, and that's the, the impetus of this grant is to do what works. We're doing what works here in South Texas. We want to do more of it. We want to uh, make it sustainable, expand it, and share it with the rest of the nation, and this is really a rare opportunity to do that through the C Texas program. So what is, oops, back one, please. That's all right. It's, it's exciting, you get excited and want to go ahead. There we go. So what is uh, C Texas? The, um, the competitive applicants, this is kind of an overview of what, what does a competitive applicant look like? A competitive applicant will propose an uh, innovative community-based solution that um, is, is already going. So the uh, community-based solutions are already happening and these, uh, the solutions are sort of quietly solving problems in the background, and we want to use this opportunity to spotlight those innovations and help them to grow. Building uh, evidence, you'll see a lot of language in the RFP about building evidence. We will have rigorously evaluated and shared programs. Uh, or, uh, organizations need to be able to evaluate things already to some degree, but uh, more than that need to be willing to scale up their evaluation efforts through the support mechanisms available in this grant. It is an unusual grant. A lot of grants you'll see limit the amount of money you can spend on evaluation. This one does completely the opposite. You're very strongly encouraged to dedicate funds to uh, supporting your evaluation. And it was the same at our level when, when I wrote the application to submit it to SIF. Uh, we had some negotiations back where our, um, our funds going toward evaluation actually went up before we were finished negotiating. And then your, your interventions will be scalable and sustainable. Uh, regarding the sustainability, we get back to that one-to-one -one match opportunity to bring in new supporters. People across the nation are, are looking at South Texas right now because of this opportunity. So we have a great chance to bring in new supporters and to show people the work that we're already doing. While we're uh, scaling up our interventions, which can, it doesn't mean just counting more heads. When we talk about scaling up, we can we can do more of the same thing. We can make it bigger, or we can make it better. So it doesn't, it doesn't have to be uh, just more numbers. The, the, the little line doesn't have to keep going up. It can be scalable in a different way. And while we're doing all of these things simultaneously, this is a, just as important as doing the interventions in this <coughs> grant, we are also building the capacity of the organizations that are participating in this. Um, so by the end of this grant, we want to have the strongest interventions, the most robust evaluations, and the most attractive programs to other funders and other supporters and other partners throughout the whole nation. Now we can go. This slide shows how the Social Innovation Fund works, um, how it all fits together, and, and how uh, the Social Innovation Fund and the corporation has uh, decided to expand their reach. This is uh, from last year, our numbers now, you see uh, 20 intermediary grantees, now we are 27, and our 
the nonprofit organizations that we work with, last year were 217, we will become a lot more than that. And again, exponential in, uh, impact on the, the number of people that we're impacting throughout the nation. This is in your RFP, this is our theory of change. When we applied for the grant, we had this theory of change. We've got to stick with the theory of change. And when uh, sub-recipients are applying for these funds, uh, the theory of change needs to remain consistent throughout. So we're go integrated behavioral health is a team-based model which medical me and mental health providers coordinate and collaborate to more fully address the range of patient needs. So this is what we're going to stick with throughout the grant, and it's very important when you apply for the grant to remain consistent with this theory of change throughout uh, your work plan and all the other documents that go along with the application. On page 18 of the RFP, there's a quick list of the qualities of a successful applicant, and these are just a few of them that I wanted to point out. Whoop. Can you go back one more? <coughs> oh, there's one in between. There we go. Obviously, you operate IBH programs already. Uh, you have a clear plan and a sufficient budget. So whatever is proposed in the plan should also match uh, with the budget. This isn't the time to try and uh, be too modest in what you're, what you're requesting. This is where you, you can be bold. You're trying to scale an intervention that's working. So be bold, make your plan, uh, propose a budget that will support that plan. We want to see an evidence of strong leadership in your organization and uh, the capacity of your organization, either now or the uh, awareness of, of how to achieve the capacity that you need to run the program that you want to run. And then most of all, the commitment. So demonstrating the commitment of your staff, your leaders, your board, the people who are involved in the program, your partners, and having a strong commitment to making this successful will be very important. That went backwards. Look for the, I think the next one's the chart. There we go. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, you were on the right one. Yeah. The last one is the um, IBH definition. Did I show you that one? Yeah, I showed you this one. Okay, we're good. This is the definition of IBH. This is also in your packet. And the next one shows the, here we go, the SAMHSA HRSA IBH framework. So when we're, throughout the RFP, we, we refer to this framework. Um, it is on page six of your RFP. And you can look in here to see um, where, you, where your organization falls in terms of integration. So integrating your primary care and your behavioral health together, and you'll notice that at level one and two, what we're calling integration is uh, things like um, appreciating each other's roles, being aware of the other group's services. So this doesn't mean that you're, you're already living in the same space and sharing the EMR and seeing each other every day and going to each other's meetings. You just, you just need to be aware of each other and communicating, not all the time, but sometimes. So you can look through these descriptions on, on this framework and kind of identify where your organization fits in. And an important thing to do when you're writing the, the proposal is to know how you can move along this continuum to become more integrated. So if you're, if you're a two right now and your plan is to become a six, then look at your work plan and your narrative and your budget and uh, align all of those things so that by the end of the grant period, you're able to become uh, the level that you, that you desire to become. One of, uh, there was one more thing I wanted to point out on this slide on, uh, on the chart on level four. Um, you'll see that there are some, if you're using uh, similar, using the same systems for uh, uh, doing your healthcare, 
One of the opportunities that MHM has to offer is uh, what we call the INEX system. It's a unified referral system. And that's something you wouldn't need to include in your budget. MHM is already paying for this. It's available to all of the subgrantees. So you would automatically have that resource at, at hand to have a referral system in place. So that would, that would be one tool that would help you move along the continuum that's already, already there for you. Right. This, these points go back to what I was saying earlier about the ways that you can uh, scale up and the things you need to make your plan very clear. You want to replicate support or enhance your model. You want to measure your improvements and show health improvements within the five-year project plan period. And you want to have a clear, there's a work plan and a logic model attachment. In your RFP, you'll see that there is a sample uh, work plan. When you go online, I don't think we put it in the packet yet, but when you go online, there's a whole packet of all of the, the extra materials that go along with the application. And one of them is a sample work plan. You can use that one. If you have your own work plan, you can use that one. Same thing with the logic model. It's an example. Um, you can use any logic model that, that works for your organization. You probably have some of these things already in place. So you don't have to use the exact ones that we put in there. All right, next slide. When you're looking at your levels of evidence, you need to be able to show that your uh, intervention has at least preliminary levels of evidence, and your uh, plan needs to show how you, how you are going to move to either moderate or strong levels of evidence. You'll see a full description of that on page seven in the RFP. Um, there's a, a subtlety that I want to point out on here. You, um, you'll have a chance to describe your evaluation capacity, and that's different than your levels of evidence. So your evaluation capacity describes your organization's ability to carry out the evaluation. And then what we're talking about here, the levels of evidence will describe your, your actual intervention. And so you can see uh, primary levels of evidence include things like uh, literature review or someone else has done the intervention and it, it's shown to be effective and so you can you can presume that the intervention is effective in, in your area or you've done pre post test or you've done uh, survey with, with clients afterwards so it's it's these kinds of things and then as you move into moderate you're you're looking at uh, quasi-experimental design and all these evaluator words that our evaluation team likes to use, but more rigorous models of evaluation. And then strong is, of course, even, even more of this evaluator language that I will say for our evaluation team to talk about when we get the chance for that. All right, let's go on. When we talk about organizational capacity, we're talking about the commitment of the organizational leadership, um, the systems that you have in place, your capacity to evaluate, your interest to grow. So you'll have a chance to explain all of these things um, in your work plan. You'll also notice that there are two tools uh, that are required attachments on the grant. They're the monitoring and evaluation capacity assessment tool to look at your ability to, to do evaluation, and then the HIMSS Delta Analytics Assessment, which is a similar tool, uh, slightly different tool. You'll, you, you'll do these, and then the expectation is not that if you score low on these assessments that your grant will score low. The expectation is that you would use these tools to understand your program and have a very clear understanding of where you are in this moment where you plan to be and then how you plan to get there. So you'll be able to reveal any weaknesses in these areas and then describe how you'll address those. Uh, maybe you will discover that you uh, need to include something in your budget that you hadn't thought of previously, so you would just make sure to include that. So when you're doing these, really give them, um, give these assessments the, the time you need to integrate them into your into your plan. It's not something you'd want to wait till the very end and do them and just throw them in the packet as, as an afterthought. All right, next slide. We touched on this a little bit earlier. The, um, the evaluation component is a very, very important part of this grant. It, 
to us, it, it looks like as much an evaluation grant as it is an implementation grant. Um, uh, at the programs across the nation, we went to the CIF convening uh, where all the programs from across the nation come together and they're talking about what they're doing and they, they're bringing extremely rigorous evaluation and they're, they're starting to focus it on stories, which is so cool because you bring the, all this all this data stuff that just is a pile of numbers and I'm sure it's very interesting to people that do that. And, but then we get to start turning it into stories about what's going on in the communities. I think that's really exciting. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to see our community start to do that where we collect this data together and then we begin to make stories with it. Yes? I'm just curious, are any of the evaluators looking at mm, That's a good question. I don't know. I don't want to answer that without knowing for sure. I know we got 12 applicants, um, but I'll put that on the FAQs. What was the question? Oh, the question was if any of the evaluators are local. So we put out the request for bid. We received 12 applicants, and the uh, bids are being reviewed right now. And I don't know the answer to that, so I'll hold off and answer that one on the FAQs on the website. When you're working on your plan, you want to make sure, of course, that you have sufficient budget to do the plan. And that would include uh, a two-year budget. So we've talked, this, can, this is a little confusing. We have a five-year program with a two-year budget and a one-year detailed budget. Uh, so when you see that, it's not a typo. <laughs> it's for real. You, the, the project plan, we have a commitment from SIF for a five-year project. Because of the way federal spending works, we have a two-year commitment on the funding with uh, uh, high likelihood, I, I hope, of renewal uh, to go throughout the whole five years. But right now, we're looking at two years of funding. And then on the budget forms, you'll see that you do a one-year detailed budget, so with all the categories and everything. And then for year two, there's a blank at the bottom. It says you, year two budget, and you put the dollar amount right there. And so that's all you need to do on that. The one-to-one uh, -one match, we want to see that you have a strong commitment to the match. And so that's what we're looking for. You have some time. The grant uh, programs, the subgrant programs will begin in May of 2016, and I mean 2015, sorry. And so you have a year from when you begin the program to secure the whole match. So you have until April 2016 and with lots of support from MHM, also from uh, SIF. They're interested in helping us make connections with new funders, um, introduce people to our programs that, that weren't aware of them before. Yes? I'm sorry, one more time? Okay, so for the, the year two match, yes, I think, I think so. I'm going to make sure, and I'll put it on the FAQ so you have the official answer. Um, but yes, you have a 12-month period in which to secure the match for that year. Let's see. Other points on the, the budget, I was asked about construction costs, but naturally we're doing integrated behavioral health, co-location is a part of that, so can the grant pay for construction? Unfortunately not. It's a non-construction program that this comes through. So you, th this is where the innovation part comes in. How are you going to uh, deal with that parameter? Um, there's, it, it will pay for all of the other typical costs, so technology, personnel. Uh, supplies and uh, travel and all of the other pretty standard costs that you see on a federal grant, but not construction on this one. Can the match be for building? Can the match be for building? I'm, again, I'm going to verify and post it on the FAQs, uh, but my hunch is that the, the match has to follow the same rules as the original federal funding, and so I'm thinking that no, for construction dollars could not count as your match dollars. Yes. 
Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it can be a little tricky on the timeline. For that grant year. Yeah, and there are some subtleties in there. Um, I know Becca had a conversation with our federal partners. So if she's able to come back in here before we finish, I'd like to circle back to that question because she has a lot more detail on the timeline and, and how the match fits in um, into your, your spending and when you're going to draw down funds and all of these details. He was asking about the match and uh, the match that is due by April 2016 is for the prior year, not the year that follows after. All right, let's go to the next one. This graphic is from the Social Innovation Fund and uh, shows Again, the multiplying effect in a little bit different way. So you see the little seed over here of the government investment in the program. And then it comes to the, the intermediary and the seed begins to grow leaves. And we have the, the government investment plus the intermediary investment. It goes to the community. We add the nonprofit investment along with the other two and we, we grow our tree. And then we partner in this community of funders throughout the nation and that's how we have our, our little forest there. I like, I'm a graphical person when I think of things so I like this to see how, how things will progress for us. Oh, one more thing. By the end of the year, uh, we estimate that this 600 million in community solutions will be about 750 million in community solutions by the end of uh, this grant year. Let's see the next one. These are the scoring criteria. They are on page 18 where you have all the detail that you need. This is just a quick summary so you can see uh, the overall areas where you're scored and the relative points assigned to each area. The reviewers of, of this grant are not MHM people. Uh, this is a, we've engaged a whole new process to review our grants this time. We've got external reviewers that include um, an evaluation professional, an integrated, be health, integrated behavioral health professional, and a funder on each team. So when the grants are submitted, they go through a rigorous review with each of these teams. They're scoring uh, using a, a, an established rubric, so it's a, very, a fair and open scoring process for this grant. Let's see, let's look at the next slide. I think it has a, our list. Yeah, there we go. That's our list of, of applicant reviewer teams. Also, this speaks to the necessity for the mandatory letter of intent. Uh, that's a little unusual, I know. A lot of times letters of intent are, uh, are optional. This time we need it to be mandatory by December 19th so that we can make sure that we have enough external reviewers. If we were using in-house staff, we could just add more to the list, but we're using external people from all across the nation uh, to review these. We've had inquiries, a, a somewhat competitive process to be a reviewer on this grant, and we had inquiries um, from, we have an IBH provider from the West Coast who I think wants to learn about how we in South Texas are addressing these issues. So by re being a grant reviewer, they also get a, a peek at how we're solving problems that they're having to deal with too. So I thought that was pretty encouraging uh, that we already have this level of interest. Let's go to the next one. All right, here's your timeline. The RFP was available on Halloween. You can find it at mhm.org slash SITexas. And you'll also find on that website our FAQs. From today, we're collecting the questions. We'll have the official answers to all of these questions to ensure an open and competitive process so that even the people who aren't in this room can get the answers at the same time. We will post all of those to the website. And uh, then the mandatory LOI deadline of December 19th. The grant application is due January 5th by midnight 
and there's an online application form that is not available yet. You have the RFP, you will have, um, later this week you'll have all of the attachments that go with the RFP, so you can begin working on applications right away. You have everything you need for that. The online application system is really an upload place, so uh, you'll collect all of your materials, get them uh, put into PDFs, and then upload them through the online application system. And then the project start date, of course, is May of 2015. In here, between the, the January and the May, I know that's a long stretch between the application and then you, you uh, find out in April and then you start in May. Uh, there, there's a multi-level review process that happens where we are, it's not just a you submit the application, we score and we say yes or no. There's gonna be some communication in there and uh, some uh, conversation about uh, the program, some negotiation. And so by the time it's, it's final, it will have taken that long. All right, let's see the next one. I know we have a, a big audience here and uh, not everybody here is going to be a grantee. So there are other ways you can get involved. You can become a partner with another organization that wants to become a grantee. You can, of course, donate to that one-to-one -one match and help out in that way. You can also volunteer to be an expert reviewer. We have a form on the website, excuse me, at mhm.org slash ctexas. There's a reviewer interest form if you would like to um, apply to be a reviewer. That way we have a, enough people to make sure that, that we can review all of the applications that come in this cycle and, if necessary, in a future cycle of this grant. And here we go. When you need to ask questions as you're going along, um, any questions you ask today, we'll, we'll collect and get those on the FAQs. If you have a question later on um, or you'd like to um, ask it in, with, without speaking today, you can send it to ctexas at mhm.org. May and I check that email daily and we'll get the right person to answer your question and get it back to you. The FAQ page, as I mentioned, is on the website. And then if you have other CTEX's inquiries that are not uh, questions we would need to post on the FAQs, you can call us at this number, 210-581-2286, uh, or you can send other inquiries to CTEX's at mhm.org. I think that's what we have today. There's the websites again. If you're curious about the Corporation for National and Community Service and CIF and how it all fits together on the national stage, you can go to nationalservice.gov to learn more about our funder and how all this is coming together. Yes, ma'am. I was looking at, at the deadlines mm -hmm. and the holidays, and mm -hmm. a lot of these organizations are small, mm -hmm. you know, with resources. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, is that Yes, the question's about deadlines, and the, the deadlines are hard deadlines. We can't have any exceptions uh, to the deadlines because we, we do have to assure a fair and equitable process for reviewing all of the grants, so that is the, the deadline. I know we have a couple of grant writers sitting over on this side of the room in case you need some help. Yes? The 30-page limit includes the narrative and the budget narrative, and then the attachments are separate, the, um, like the logic model. I think that's outside of the... Yes, yeah, those would be outside. The, the hymns delta and the, yeah. Okay. Do you have any other questions while we're here together? Smaller nonprofits can make it together and apply, say, mm -hmm. the doctor clinic, co clinic, and another one mm -hmm. as one app. That's a good question. So the question is about how, uh, <laughs> what is the nature of partnership uh, among applicants? So if you have some smaller applicants that um, aren't eligible or um, not interested in applying, being the, the applicant for the grant, can you still work together? And the, the answer is a little bit tricky. So yes, you can work together, um, but you can only have one applicant. 
and you can only have one budget, one organization is responsible for the match, one organization is responsible for the administration of the grant. It's got to be very clear uh, in that way. But you can set up vendor relationships. You cannot subgrant. So uh, MHM is the intermediary. We are subgranting awards to people. Our, our subgrantees cannot subgrant again, but you can set up vendor relationships. So if you um, have a partner and you want to write a contract for a specific service, that, that is possible through the grant. You just have to follow the federal procurement guidelines and all of, all of that sort of thing. It's federal money, so you have to follow the federal money rules. Good question. Thank you for asking. I think that's a great idea. Are you guys good with that? I'll post it on the website. Yeah, great. That's what we had. Santiago was recording as we went around. The mic has a cord, so it would have been a little unwieldy to drag it through your lunch, but um, Santiago was recording your introduction. So we'll get a list posted on our website of who's here today. And then we have another workshop taking place in Laredo on Thursday with the same information, so you'll be able to see who, who's attending that, too. Mm -hmm. No, it's great. The $6 million, mm -hmm. is that set aside for Hidalgo County or $6 million for all those 12 counties? Yeah, the $6.5 million is for all 12 counties uh, per year. Great. Well, I'll shut it down for right now. Oh, I have one more question. Come on. Yes, yes. I'm glad you asked. Uh, the question is about being bold in your request. Um, if you're asking for one of the larger grant amounts, we are required to align the dollar amounts with the level of evidence. So this is an important thing to bring out. It's in the RFP, but I do want to point that out, that if you're coming forward with a program that has very preliminary evidence of the intervention, then you would be eligible for a lesser award amount than someone who came forward with more evidence that the intervention works. So with a stronger preliminary evidence or with a moderate level of evidence, uh, they would be eligible for a greater award amount. So there is that big gap between the January application and the May start date, one of the things that happens in there is that our review committee will uh, look at the applications in terms of evidence, and then we will have to align them with the grant amounts. Yes, there could be negotiation on the, on the budget. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you guys for being here. This is an excellent turnout. I'm, I'm so excited to work with you and to see what comes forward. Um, don't hesitate to ask questions as they come to mind as you're going through the packet and the materials and the website and learning about the opportunity. Uh, get back in touch with us and, and let us know what you have going. Thank you.